commitment to learner-driven education. It's a process of using tools for learning and building architectures for learning that allow students to shape the public knowledge commons of which they are a part. Now, of course, open pedagogy draws on open licensing, no doubt, but it also draws on a long history in critical pedagogy. So I'm just going to read this bit from Henry Giroux's work. He writes that critical pedagogy takes seriously the educational imperative to encourage students to act on the knowledge, values, and social relations they acquire by being responsive to the deepest and most important problems of our times. And of course, that logically leads very nicely to the Sustainable Development Goals, which are certainly the most important problems of our times. I'm sure you're all familiar with the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. And of course, within all of these, which are all important, you could argue that goal number four, uh, ensuring an inclusive and equitable quality education is really at the heart of all of the other 17. You can support gender equality if you support education. You can support sustainable consumption if you support education, and so on. A couple of years ago, uh, Montgomery College seized upon this idea. This idea is baked into this document, uh, Education for Sustainable Development Goals, published by UNESCO. And I'm not going to read all of that, but this document talks about an action-oriented transformative pedagogy. It supports self-directed learning, participation, collaboration, problem orientation, uh, inter- and transdisciplinarity, and the linking of formal and informal learning. In many ways, this is really what open pedagogy is all about. And so Montgomery College is a community college in Maryland in the United States. Two years ago, they pioneered an open pedagogy fellowship that involved faculty working with their students to design uh, resources as part of their coursework that serve progress towards specific sustainable development goals. It was a fantastic program, really, really well uh, received, and they produced resources like this. This is an example of one assignment uh, from Communication Studies and Business Administration at Montgomery College uh, that focuses on social justice and entrepreneurship. This was fantastic work from a wonderful uh, set of colleagues at this community college. So of course at KPU we were inspired by their work, we reached out, we asked if we could collaborate, and this year we launched an international, interinstitutional, interdisciplinary open pedagogy fellowship with Montgomery. This involved teams of faculty, teams of three, across both institutions, working together over several months across different disciplines to design assignments that would be deployed in courses uh, that, of course, focus on sus specific sustainable development goals and the creation often of o open educational resources around those. Um, if you're interested in actually looking at the assignments themselves that were designed, uh, you can see them on our website. You can certainly even view faculty testimonials and brief descriptions of these projects. I'm not going to tell you about all of them, Except to say, imagine what it looks like. You can see the example over here. As a faculty member from urban ecosystems, sustainable horticulture, and anthropology, all three, working together on a single set of assignments. In another case, we had faculty from marketing, educational studies, and math working on the same assignments. And so the kind of cross-pollination that we saw was quite extraordinary. I do want to share the voice of one of our faculty participants, though. Um, her name is Jennifer Hardwick. She teaches in the English department. And this is why she was attracted to the fellowship. Because I've been using open pedagogy in my classes for the last five or six years, and I've used renewable assignments before and media assignments before, and I think they're very effective. I think they allow a kind of creativity and engagement that a lot of other assignments don't. And I am a writing instructor primarily. I'm interested in good communication, and I think that that communication should extend in the digital age to different kinds of assignments, different ways of employing rhetoric and uh, self-expression. And so this is a good opportunity to encourage students to think about those skills. I'm also interested in using open pedagogy because I want students to think deeply about it. And I want them to think about access to information and uh, the ethics that guide that. Both the ethics of what we see now in education in terms of the high costs of textbooks and um, the inaccessibility of a lot of resources, but also on the other end, the way that the academy has been um, complicit in extracting knowledge and in um, monetizing knowledge uh, that doesn't necessarily belong to the people who are doing the extracting. And so I want students thinking carefully about the information that they gather and the information that they share and um, how to do that in ethical ways. And I think that open assignments are a great way to introduce those conversations. 
So more broadly, this fellowship is one of the forms of open pedagogy that's featured, if you're interested, in the Open Pedagogy Notebook, which showcases a much wider range of open pedagogies. But I'll maybe close by saying this. Open education is not just about equitable access to knowledge. It's also about trying to strive towards equitable access to knowledge creation. And we believe that integrating open pedagogy and the sustainable development goals into the curriculum, into student training, represents a powerful model for education, one that is democratizing, one that is participatory, inclusive, and certainly authentic. I'll leave it there. The slides are openly licensed, but I'd love to take a question if we have time. Thank you. Uh, Dave. Is that United Nations uh, fellowship still going? Uh, so the question was, uh, is the fellowship still going? Yes, it is still going. In fact, it has gone so well that we're going to be expanding it into the next year, uh, opening up a call for all British Columbia institutions. But this is a model that we would encourage other institutions to look at. We're always interested in collaborating and partnering. Um, the call will go out in the spring. The faculty work over the summer and deploy the assignments the following academic year. Thanks for your question. Thank you. Um, I guess I'll introduce myself right quick. I'm sorry, I like to move around. Um, Susan Huggins with the Open Education Consortium. I'm the communications director. Um, and Mario, introduce yourself. My name is Mario Vadilla from Costa Rica, and I am the creative director in the Open Education Consortium. So we are actually going to take you on, thank you, it's hard for me to stand still. So we're going to just take you, um, I don't want to say fun, uh, but we're going to take you on a little historical walk through open education. Um, open education to show you where, how we got to where we are today. What has happened in the past that will affect our future? Um, the reason that we even bring this up is because it does have to do with your annual strategic planning. Where have you come from? Where are you going? What are your new goals? What are your plans for 2020 as we approach the end of this year and the beginning of a new year? So if you want to start, I have actually have to read because I could not remember everything. So, what I want to share with you are just simply some historical milestones of open education, and we will share this later, and you'll have all these dates, and, and if I find one that's not quite right, or if I uh, mention one, please let me know, because uh, I did find research that was very conflicting. So, way back in 2001, there was uh, the beginning of the Creative Commons, uh, the term open education resources was coined by UNESCO in 2002. The first CC license was also in 2002. Uh, MIT OpenCourseWare, 2002. Um, CCCOER, I wanted to mention, our, our very first uh, node was created in 2007. Cape Town Declaration, also 2007. So here we are, a lot of focus on courseware, um, the beginnings of OER, the beginnings of, of open research. I'm trying to watch Marcella. Um, actually, OCWC, the Open Courseware Consortium, was actually first coined back in 2007 as well when the MIT open courses were um, being released. In 2008, we elected OpenCourseWare Consortium, our first board of directors, and uh, officially launched our very first global meeting in 2008. And 2009 through 2013 was the emergence of MOOCs. We saw Coursera, uh, Udemy, Udacity, uh, OpenStax, all that showed up between 2008 and 2013. OERU launched in 2013. And in fact, there was a New York Times article in 2013 that claimed 2013 as the year of the MOOC. Okay, going a little further into 
2013 to current, the UNESCO two, uh, Second World OER Congress was in 2017. Okay. Uh, Creative Commons reached 1.4 billion licenses across the world. Uh, Cape Town Plus 10 was just a few years ago in 2017. As we moved into the Cape Town Declaration, which uh, Rajiv just showed the, um, th what came from the Cape Town Declaration, um, OEC started expanding their partnerships as well. We started looking at collaborations more so than looking directly within by just connecting you with courses and promoting courses. Uh, we, we started expanding and launching partnerships. And in 2014, OCWC became Open Education Consortium, which was uh, 2014. And in 2019, we celebrated our, our 10th year anniversary. So I say all this because we use that to look to the future. We use that to look at trends. What has been going on? What is happening? How did we get to where we are today? And Mario, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Well, this focus of open education has uh, changed into many forums like open textbooks, open pedagogy, open, uh, open access. So this open education landscape has changed to less about open courses and more about collaboration and inspiring and connecting people. So uh, this is about connecting people uh, from very different backgrounds. Uh, also about bringing new perspectives and collaborations and contributions to the table and, and, uh, and having a fair distribution of resources also. And this change is also about uh, acknowledging that sharing can also have uh, help uh, business and creators and makers uh, impact their communities and also globally. And also that uh, learning can be more flexible, can be customized, uh, open education resources can be adapted, localized, or uh, adapted to different realities uh, of different contexts of different students. And this learning can also be measured and improved with or using open data. This change is also about uh, that it is possible to have sustainable development uh, with content that is not restricted, and having non-restricted licenses, uh, data, or even uh, source code. And okay, thank you. And well, international collaboration is possible. For example, this conference and this international collaboration can start locally or regionally with regional notes that we have heard today. So there's this evolution of this change of open education is also uh, reflected in the focus of the consortium. So we can talk about different or expansion of the membership that the consortium has and also talking about communication tools, for example, a listserv, so uh, members can talk to each other and engage in collaboration. Also support and visualizing open source technology and the partner projects that Susan mentioned before. So these are some of the focus that uh, are related to these trends and that we are uh, very happy to mention and share with you from the Open Education Consortium. So thank you. I know that was an awful lot in eight minutes. Any questions for us? Thank you. Sweet. I'm glad I figured that out since I don't speak any Italian and all the um, all of the. Uh, um, the menu was in Italian, so yay, I'm glad that worked. <laughs> um, good afternoon, everyone. 
My name is Lauren Roberts, and I teach at South Mountain Community College, um, which is one of the Maricopa County Community Colleges. We are located in Phoenix, Arizona, in the United States. And my talk today, I'm, oh, you know, I'm going to start my timer so I don't go over. <laughs> um, my talk today is talking a little bit about um, openly licensed images, and it's actually kind of a call to action as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. So first of all, I teach biology, and I don't know if I have any other science instructors in here. Maybe a show of hands. <laughs> Anyone? No? Oh, a couple. Yay, I see a couple. Um, so in the sciences especially, images are a really important part of learning when it comes to diagrams and tables and figures and graphs. Um, and, so, and so I teach some general biology and also an anatomy and physiology. Um, coloring books are a, a resource that's often required or at least recommended in addition to a textbook. So think about it, you've got a textbook, a lab manual, and then this kind of ancillary resource um, that can actually cost as much of a textbook. And I don't know if you can see um, the price on the screen, so this is a screenshot of a anatomy and physiology coloring book that I found on Amazon. Um, it's $82 to purchase it. And then it's $47 to rent it. And I don't understand how you rent something that you're supposed to color and label and market. And so I thought that was kind of interesting. So one of my main hurdles uh, when adopting OER was the lack of images. Um, with most publisher, kind of traditional publisher textbooks, you get ancillary materials, which include images with um, easy to edit leader lines and labels. Um, and I have to give a little shout out to my cute puppy dog there. <laughs> so um, that's Danny. <clears throat> um, and as you can see, I can't really draw. So <laughs> these are actual pictures that I have drawn on a whiteboard in order to help um, kind of illustrate some concepts for my students. Um, so taking someone who's not an artist who is trying to develop images, um, it was kind of a challenge. So I started out by using um, just some simple editing tools that you can find in Microsoft PowerPoint or Google Slides. And this can include just cropping images, converting them to black and white, um, taking a white uh, box and just covering labels in order to um, kind of hide things from students. Um, so that was kind of my, my original easy way of editing images. Um, and then about a year ago, I purchased an iPad with the Apple Pencil, and I discovered this um, app called the Procreate app, which is kind of a fun name. Um, it's about $10 to download it. It's a one-time fee, and it's very intuitive. So I had tried to learn um, Photoshop before, and first of all, Photoshop is expensive. Um, you have to sign up for a monthly fee, and it's not very user friendly in my opinion. I, I took a course in it and I still don't know how to use it. <laughs> um, this app is very intuitive. Um, it's worth every penny of the $10 to, to download it. Um, so you can trace images, you can erase parts of images, um, you can draw, you can add layers, um, and then you can export it in different file formats. So I know this is a paid technology. Unfortunately, I don't know of an open technology that allows you to do this, although it might exist. Um, but it can still at least be shared openly. <clears throat> so this is a video that kind of shows my process. Maybe. There we go. <laughs> um, so this is a sheep brain, if you're not familiar. This is something that we typically dissect in an anatomy and physiology class to learn about the structures of the brain. And I wanted to make a coloring paper or page that my students could label. Um, oh, sorry, go back. <laughs> so um, this kind of shows um, a screencast of my process. Um, so you can see um, in the upper right, I'm adding layers. And you can see that I um, basically just traced over this picture that I took, and then I removed the background layer. And then I added another layer with leader lines so I can export it for my students and have them label structures. 
And then another layer that actually has labels on it so that I can make an answer key available for my students. Um, here are some other uh, resources that I have developed with the app. Um, so I give my students this the first week of class. This is how to draw a graph. Um, and whenever they struggle with creating a graph, I tell them to pull out their guide. Um, <clears throat> so you can see it's really easy to do um, straight lines, um, but you can also kind of freehand um, and kind of make it fun. Um, this is another resource with um, kind of showing students how to use a micro pipetter. Um, once again, I have drawings, I have tracings, I have pictures, um, and writing in there. So in conclusion, um, this is kind of the call to action. So please don't forget images when you are producing and remixing and finding open educational resources. Um, they say a picture is worth a thousand words, and I agree. Um, there are many tools in order to edit and remix um, openly licensed images. Um, the ones I shared with you today are just my personal favorites, but I'm sure there are tons of others out there that exist. Um, <clears throat> and I would love to hear if there are other tools that you use. Um, and then to make sure that you include this, the Creative Commons licensing and share them so that we can all benefit. Thank you for your time. <laughs> And um, I think I have maybe a minute or two, unless we want to jump to the next one. But are there any questions? We do? OK. Are there any questions or thoughts or comments or? Yes. Where, where do I share them? Um, that's a great question. I have not shared them yet. <laughs> I know I said share them. Um, that's also a call to action for myself. Um, so my plan is over the winter holiday to sit down and um, kind of organize things and, and share them. Um, but right now, if you're interested in them, you can email them, or you can email me, and they're all in a Google Drive, so I can um, easily share them at the moment. But I do plan on just sharing them more publicly as soon as I get the time. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else? All right, thank you. <laughs> thank you all for coming. My name is Yulia Titus, and now we will move smoothly from sciences to humanities. I teach Russian language and literature in Russian at Yale University, and I've been doing it for more than 20 years, and when I first started, I discovered that why people want to learn Russian? Well, because of its great literature. And I was trying to think uh, very hard what I can do to help my students to keep them motivated because we all talk about open education resources and why do we develop these materials so that our students can uh, really use them outside the classroom. We want to extend the classroom uh, beyond just the hours that we're allowed to teach. So I started thinking what could be done to introduce authentic materials early in the instruction, because certainly after, everybody wants to read Dostoevsky, but we all know that just like reading Dante in Italian, it may take many, many, many years. So I figured that to introduce short poems, perhaps, would be the ideal medium to have the students engaged, because it's very motivating, immediately start reading something authentic and culturally meaningful. And you can see that a lot of things that we teach can be demonstrated in authentic poetic text because you can already see the unfamiliar vocabulary. You can already see the structures of the language and so on and so forth. Um, so, of course, as we read any foreign text, there are many difficulties because in Russian, uh, compounded to usual difficulties of uh, learning vocabulary, scarcity of context, there is different syntax, and also uh, the written language is very often much more challenging than the speaking language. And finally, there is cultural context. So to combat these difficulties, we uh, feel that it's very important to canvas the text so it becomes more accessible. And OER or web, uh, web materials, web-based materials, um, offer us great possibilities to provide these tools to our students. So um, my work 
uh, has actually been twofold because I created first this paper. This is an anthology of Russian poetry. So if you read in Russian, you should check it out. There are uh, 20 greatest Russian poets from Pushkin to Mayakovsky. It's a Russian canon. They're all selected and annotated. But of course, having it also on the web allows us to do so much more because we can have simultaneous audio, right? We can certainly... Um, allow students multiple um, uh, attempts to work with the site, and hopefully I'll have a few minutes, because this is just PowerPoint, but I will show you the actual, the actual module, which is an open educational resource. The site is open to everyone, and you can access it free of charge. So it looks like this. Um, and um, as I said, uh, the, oh, five minutes, very good. Thank you. So I will skip through the slides, and these are just um, uh, obviously screenshots from the project. But I will go now uh, to the um, actual site and I will show you what it contains. Um, and I've done a similar uh, thing also with prose text. So that's why this one is not only for poetry, but again, uh, the purpose of today's presentation is to illustrate how this particular thing can be adapted whether you wish to work with poetry, which I think is very user-friendly for beginners because poetry is simply shorter. Or you can also work with prose text. And again, for prose, that would be more accessible for intermediate and advanced learners because they simply have more language. So now I will go, because we are very lucky and we have internet here, so I will close my PowerPoint and I'll show you a little bit. Yes, et voilà. So this is actual site. It lives online. It's completely free, completely accessible. So you can do uh, two things. So uh, again, to get familiar with cultural context, because it's, it's, very, um, it's very helpful uh, to understand the settings. So since it was geared to the American students, uh, you have these options. You can read this in target language. Uh, et voilà. So even, even very beginners, Pushkin it's a very basic thing. Because this, of course, you can, I mean, you have to have some Russian, but you can follow. It's not very challenging. Then I will show you very quickly a little thing that I just read with my first year students. And I just did it in my class before I came here. Because uh, if you know something about Russian, you know, accusative case we just covered. So this is great, one of the greatest poems in Russian language. And the approach is much the same. So you see the poem is heavily glossed. You, I mean, every, basically, two-thirds of the words are glossed, if you so wish. There is audio. Я вас любил. Что такое случилось? Okay, I, I paused it in a bit. Любовь еще быть может в душе моей угас. I don't know, it keeps pausing. Не совсем. Но пусть она вас больше не тревожит. Я не хочу печалить вас. So all these things that I mentioned, the cultural context, so this is original page from Pushkin's sketchbook, which shows us the rough draft and the portrait of the woman that he was in love, right? Uh, the glosses and the scaffolding. Then, of course, reading is only part of it, because in the beginning it's very important to work on structure. Well, in my opinion, it's so important to work on structure always, <laughs> because <laughs> that's what I do. And you can see there are supplementary exercises. So the advantage of this type of project is you can work with it in class, as I did, because for me it's tied to the accusative case. But say you're learning Russian in another program, you can still work in whatever fashion you choose, right? Because poem is easy, and I always tell my students, if you don't have much time, you probably can find 20 minutes to read the poem. So I do think that having this type of materials in open access has really done a great deal for uh, improving our teaching, because we want to, to turn our students into lifelong learners, and it's materials like this that would allow us to move towards this goal, because we don't only want to teach uh, them for 50 minutes a day, but we want them to really, really do something when classes are not meeting. So I would welcome any questions on that material, if you have any. 
Well, I hope you do something like that. If you teach foreign languages, then you can do this for Italian. I mean, I would love, uh, because I study Italian, parlo italiano, and I would love uh, very much, but not Dante, because I mean, Dante, La Commedia, is heavily annotated. Actually, my colleague at Yale, um, uh, Giuseppe Mazzotta, made a huge, great, great site for La Commedia. But I would like something more, you know, uh, in terms of language, more contemporary. So, yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you, very interesting work you are doing there um, and quite innovative, I think, to link poetry in. Uh, I was wondering how the students engage with it, so what's your evidence, what's, what's the experience with, for students? Well, for me, again, we are at Yale University, so I'm in a very fortunate situation. Uh, students come to learn Russian. I mean, at Yale, we have such a thing as language requirement. That means they must take three semesters of foreign language. But if you just want to have some sort of foreign language credit, you'd probably go to Spanish, like if you, if you don't have any particular reasons. But for Russian, usually, as I said, it's majority of people who want to take Russian, they're already interested in literature. So my experience has always been very, very positive. Students, a lot of students love it. Uh, I mean, granted, it not 100% because somehow we have new students who want to help uh, investigate Russian interference in American elections, so that's a different student body. <laughs> they all want to become spies. <laughs> Those don't care much about poetry, but that's something new for me. My traditional customer has always been the lover of Dostoevsky and Chekhov and Rachmaninov, and that's, that's really the cornerstone of the program. That's why we do all that. Yeah, so, so for me it's very good, but I understand your question, because I always get, I, I showed that work, I think, in, in, in another conference, and also was asked, well, what to do if student doesn't like poetry? But I mean, that's crazy. We are at the university, we are to teach them so that they love poetry. It's part of educational process. I mean, who else will tell them, right? Yeah. Well, thank you. <laughs> Hello everyone, my name is Olga, I'm from Tom State University, Russia. I'm working together with my colleagues whom you can see on the slide. Today I would like to talk uh, about urgency in change in higher education, which is dealing with the innovation. I will tell you a little bit about our new bachelor program, what the aim is, why we are doing it, what the philosophy behind it, what, how it is constructed. Uh, first of all, I would, lay, I would like to give a brief overview of Tomsk city. Tomsk is the oldest scientific, educational, and innovation center uh, with six universities. Today, Tomsk has a population of, more, uh, of around 500,000 people, of which 15% are students coming from different parts of the world. Uh, as a result, Tomsk probably has a bigger proportion of foreign language speakers than any other Siberian city. For, uh, <coughs> since uh, uh, 2018, this team of international experts uh, from uh, Tom State University and Maastricht University developed together a new educational program uh, uh, which is interdisciplinary and present a completely new educational approach to natural science which are dealing with the different kinds of educational models and uh, open education as well. Uh, uh, the value of our program is uh, uh, intended to be in demand, not for the sake of being popular, but in order to become an important and constant contributor uh, to the enhancement of higher education in natural sciences in Russia and around the world. The mission of our program, learning from each other, developing talents, and generating new ideas for the sake of society and for the needs of the society. Uh, at TIFS, uh, we give students uh, the freedom to choose their own curricula. This means they have the responsibility to direct their own education. Depending on their ambitions and interests, students can pick from a wide variety of courses in biology, chemistry, mathematics, physics, and various interdisciplinary fields of 
studies such as ecology, bio-based materials, and neuroscience. With our uh, learning methods, problem-based education, students work in small groups in close interaction with fellow students and a tutor, solving real-life academic problems. Students learn how to think as an academic and how to work as a professional, providing them with a solid basis for the labor market. Uh, the ability to create a unique academic profile and studying in English will allow students to follow a wide variety of international programs at, in Russia and uh, around the world. The TIS provides students with a broad interdisciplinary basis for a variety of career opportunities such as a, a researcher at the university or a scientist in a company or even uh, own business in science and technology. Also, we launched a... Uh, mm, uh, pilot program, which is called Honors Program uh, in 2018, which will give the ability to adjust a new style of learning and to improve uh, English uh, of the students. By the end, uh, last, uh, um, last year, graduates uh, presented two projects, uh, one of which was dealing with the healthy lifestyle, and the second one with the recycling plastic in the 3D printing. Well, what we have learned? Uh, first of all, I would like to say that we like change in education because it's, education has changed us. In general, you can say worldwide, you know, that the society and government ask for innovation and internationalization of education and research. You see that in all, almost in the world, plans of the governments want the, the universities to be more connected to the society and to the needs of society. We fully agree with the uh, assumptions of the president of Holland College uh, that we are living in the uh, period of innovation economy, which deals with the producing of new ideas based on the intrinsic motivation and design thinking uh, of all the stakeholders of the educational process. This is connected with the era of internet technologies, overpopulation of the planet, and access of different sources of information with different interpretations. So, why innovation? Why do we really need to change something? While many people are saying, we are doing very good, we have fantastic lectures, everything is perfect. Uh, but if you look really at the essence, we know that active learning is much more efficient than passive reproducing. Another issue why we need to modernize the education is that the amount of knowledge doubles every four years. So imagine that you have four-year bachelor and now you have to learn this, but after four years you are behind this because the knowledge is doubles. So you cannot define precisely what people have to know called the knowledge that's something that is very in development. So the critical, uh, crucial issue that we have to teach our students how to learn and how to keep on learning. And the most important thing that we have to teach students not to know everything, it's impossible. We cannot give the education, we can, we, we can know everything in physics, chemistry, mathematics, biology, etc. Of course, we have only four years. But we have to teach people how to work together with the other people from other disciplines. Now, 21st century graduates uh, need a lot more. The knowledge, skills, and behavior are discussed in the literature in relation to the graduate skills and global citizenship with an understanding that graduates today need, to be, need the competences to communicate and complete in a rapidly changing, complex global world. Basically, uh, we all want that the students can do their best to do the diploma. But what does it bring if you have a diploma and don't have a job? So it's very important to have education which has an impact that at a certain moment you can use your competences and skills and knowledge to start to work in this society and for the society, for everybody. So that is the meaning. Uh, this raises the question, what are the innovation for higher education is? Now there are a lot of definitions of this. So the one I want to talk about is the kind of innovation that changes the life of people. This is not just the kind of innovation that develops a new course or a new program, but it changes the way people live on a very large scale. But we think that our traditional model for education may actually be preventing us from producing a new generation of specialists. Uh, because it doesn't correspond with the reality of present, present world, it doesn't meet the requirements of, for the future education. 
Nowadays, each case in education, education is unique. We can transfer good experience and appropriate context and avoid bad experience in similar situations. Maybe in the future, based on the university's experience, uh, with using potential of big data, we can create global open space learning for everybody. So, as a result of our hard work, we can consider the launch of the new program in 2018, the pilot in 2018 also, and the start of changing the educational model, which will help us uh, to, to implement any different kinds of educational models. Training of the faculty, new opportunities for the students, and as a result, the preparation of new generation of the specialists. We are on the way of enhancing the quality of the education. We are believe that this innovative program and such kind of innovation program can be the future of our education. Thank you very much. If this topic is hot for you, I will be pleased to discuss it with you in detail. Uh, we are Flavia and Paolo from Archilabo, and we want to present to you one of the intellectual output of our European project called uh, All Inclusive School. Okay. Archilabo is a non-profit organization that works in the field of education to foster scholastic inclusion and social innovation. Behind our vision, there is the aim to create networks among different actors, from schools to libraries, from associations to companies. And from this point of view, all these kind of organizations are part of learning pathways, both formal and informal. Uh, here there are some of our services and projects. Ampia is a specialistic center for learning disabilities that is supported by a diagnostic center for neuropsychological and cognitive uh, evaluation. Uh, Luneta Park is a community development project which tackles educational poverty through special governmental funds. Uh, on the other side, uh, there are many other projects uh, aimed at linking digital inclusion and uh, innovative educational practices. So why are we here? Um, traditional school publishing formats are very structured and based on a linear, monadic and modular vision of knowledge. Is this enough in the 21st century school? We think OER could better intercept teachers' and students' needs in order to give them a more flexible construction of contents. Um, All Inclusive School is an Erasmus Plus project uh, created by an international partnership of organizations and schools specialized uh, in uh, social inclusion, digital skills, and cooperation. Um, the project aims at developing a kit of didactic tools intended to facilitate teachers and educators working with students with mild cognitive disabilities. So let's go in details. What is Social Book Creator? Uh, SBC is a free web app to access through credentials. It is going to be designed for general and special teachers and educators who work with the heterogeneous composition of the classroom. So students with mild cognitive disabilities um, are our target group, but the app can be used with all students in the classroom. Um, one of the goals of SBC is so spreading OER in secondary education. Um, first of all, SBC allows you to create high accessible digital contents. Uh, providing an editor with embedded digital compensatory tools and uh, since, since the project development, creating an inclusive interface in terms of usability. From the point of view of uh, the SBC books, uh, they are based on standard template for highly accessible layouts. Nowadays schools, and teach nowadays, schools and teachers have a huge responsibility in training pupils' digital competences and in feeding their information literacy. And equal access to the citizenship passes through an appropriate use of technologies and through a deep awareness about their application fields. Another goal is the creation and sharing of open educational uh, resources. That's a way for students and teachers to express themselves through digital means and to conceive knowledge as modelable, renewable, and collective. 
From a regulatory point of view, Italian scholastic legislation since 2015 has introduced a national plan for digital education that doesn't only affect the amount of technological infrastructure in schools, but it establishes um, an epistemological turn in the way we should teach and learn. In particular, we refer to the Action 23 uh, of the plan that is focused on OER. Okay, some pros in the use of this kind of uh, open educational resources are the improvement in students' interest and participation, uh, the individualization of teaching content and multisensorial approach, uh, strengthening skills related to cooperative learning, the improvement of meaningful learning with uh, DIY study materials, and an impact on school dropout prevention. We anchored the uh, SBC project in this pedagogical um, theories and not secondary in our experience as uh, learning tutors. All students, and especially students with special educational needs, learn better when they learn together and when they are co-authors of their, their knowledge. Social Book Creator has two main features. The first is a Social Book Editor, an online book editor designed to get an efficient experience uh, in classroom work. At present, the beta version of the app is focusing on a defined template in order to fit to the different ways of learning, reading, and organizing the layout of the page. The accessibility of the app is also guaranteed by uh, digital compensatory tools like text-to-speech or concept maps, um, and the content you have created can be shared on social network. Social Books Cooperative Press is the second main feature. Uh, it is a cloud platform where social books are stored in. So your social books, the ones you like and the ones you follow, are categorized through a system of tags such as topic, authors, date, and editorial characteristics of accessibility. And this function is particularly interesting for us because it allows you to filter your searches based on students' cognitive style. All the materials related to the project All Inclusive School are available on its site and released under a Creative Commons license. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. If you have any questions. Yeah, yeah. <laughs>